Hello and welcome to the Collective Shift channel. Matt here to share with you the week's worth of news in the macro space and the crypto industry. I keep it to the most significant news to really help you understand and keep up to date with what's going on in the macro and crypto realms and to understand, most importantly, its significance as investors and market participants. As always, I'll wrap things up with my outlook on the crypto asset markets. Um, and for any of you, you can always go and through the play bath um, for those of you watching on video to skip through to the relevant sections you care about most. Starting as always with the Australian economy and two big pieces of news that I wanted to go through in the past seven days. The first one being the state of Victoria lifted even more restrictions late last week, so much so that now Victoria is enjoying its um, least amount, least severe restrictions uh, going all the way back to last year. So it's uh, very exciting to see the vaccination rate, um, you know, really climbing, I guess, faster than what was initially expected. And just to see so many people on the streets and um, to see cafes and restaurants full, um, it's a very exciting time. And hopefully that can continue heading into the Christmas period. Also, massive news, more from a federal and Australia-wide standpoint. Uh, yesterday, with um, announcement that fully vaccinated international students and eligible visa holders from all around the world, and in addition to that, tourists from Jap Japan and South Korea, all of them will be welcomed back into Australia as of next week. So that is just like huge, huge, significant news um, for the country and putting our macroeconomic hats on. It will be a, a massive, um, you know, welcome news in particular for the tourism and education um, sectors and, and industries. So as we've known, tourism, like basically all around the world, has been very, um, you know, very held back over the past two years and very limited in, in the amount it can it can serve and, and provide this the service of tourism. So, um, you know, particularly exciting for, for Australia, which is, you know, relative to other developed countries, um, you know, tourism, you know, accounts for a massive part or a much larger part of Australia's, uh, of our GDP relative to others. Uh, it's also a big win for the, for the academic institutions in Australia in the tertiary education space. So universities, um, which do, you know, go through and really educate a lot of international students, um, every year up until the pandemic. So very welcome news for them as well. Over in the US and just in the past 24 hours, uh, there was um, very big news that President Joe Biden has nominated um, the existing chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, which is the central bank in the US. Uh, so their existing chair, Jerome Powell, is, is going in for another term. So um, that was really, you know, in line with, with expectations. Um, there was there was some um, if it wasn't going to be Jerome Powell, it was the consensus was that it was going to be uh, Lael Brainard, um, who he did get voted in or she rather um, as the vice chair of, of the Fed's board of governors. So this is more just why why is this new significant? Uh, well, it's really just. For us as investors and, and market onlookers, it's really just important because it's, you know, it gets this big news out of the way and it's more of just now just another reason why we can expect, you know, uh, monetary stimulus or, or yes, yeah, stimulus from the central banks to continue uh, basically as it had always been going because, hey, the exact same person is now still leading the central bank. So that's essentially the big takeaway there. Um, so now with that out of the way, I would expect to see um, the news and a lot of the commentary on the state of uh, the US central banks and their outlook to really now shift back towards, hey, when is the US central bank going, is it going to continue, you know, easing their stimulus measures uh, in line with what they say? Um, and that will really just the really thing in my opinion that would really um, 
you know, determine how fast or how slow they they ease that monetary stimulus is, in my opinion, going to be the inflation rate. So that's all over the headlines as it has been in recent months. And that will really, if inflation becomes even higher than is what um, is expected by the central bank and by uh, market participants, then I would expect to see the US central bank be a bit more um, open to you know, really easing or stopping their stimulus either a lot sooner than what we had, what, than what they had planned um, initially uh, to really just, um, you know, put the brakes, so to speak, on, on the economy and do their best to, you know, reduce uh, the amount of economic growth or growth in prices rather. Um, so yeah, we do have one more Federal Reserve meeting for the year. I believe there is one in December as well as another one in Europe, which will, um, the latter will be very um, interesting to watch now given uh, the biggest news in European economy uh, in the past week has unfortunately been the, you know, the explosive growth in COVID cases and unfortunately COVID deaths so uh, or COVID related deaths rather so hospital hospitalization rates also increasing in a bunch of European nations and as a result of that you've seen um, a number of countries come out and either impose tighter restrictions on non-vaccinated citizens and you've also seen countries such as Austria become they were the first European nation to announce uh, that the COVID vaccination would become a legal requirement. So that did spark a lot of civil unrest over the weekend. We saw protests in a number of European nations, I think the Netherlands and Belgium were two of those, um, and even, even in Austria, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, we did see protests there in Vienna. So again, as I try to do in these this installment or this uh, weekly series, I try to keep it purely from a macroeconomic standpoint. And what's our biggest takeaway when it comes to seeing this sort of news? It's really just, um, unfortunately, a slowing of global economic growth. Um, and, you know, second, secondly, also just a, I guess, worse conditions for the value of the, the euro. The euro. Um, so, you know, you can expect the US dollar to really be like appreciating against the euro if cases do continue to you know really get out of control over in europe and yeah seeing here that the world health organization is now saying that it is very worried about this surge in cases happening in the continent germany is another one which has um yeah had a lot of you know civil civil unrest and a lot of debate about what to do as far as, you know, imposing or mandating vac vaccinations um, and things like that. So for those of you um, listening to the podcast, I am um, just showing here just the seven day averages um, from a bunch of different countries. Um, and yeah, just seeing the likes of a number of European nations, uh, as I've mentioned, um, all seeing a very worrying rise in the amount of COVID cases. So hopefully uh, for everyone over there that, that can um, improve in, in the coming days and weeks. And just seeing here that the US has come out and, um, you know, with this question now, okay, what if it comes over to US and what if there's a similar situation in the US now with um, just... COVID cases getting out of control and hospitals getting overwhelmed. Uh, the US has, at least for now, the White House um, Coronavirus Response Coordinator. Um, that's quite a, quite a position. They've come out and said that we can curb the spread of the virus without having to, in any way, shut down our economy. So the US, at least, very um, just backing in their own you know, um, infrastructure and, and their own I guess, plans that they can continue to uh, function as an economy and society, even if cases do continue to, ex even if cases in the US do explode like they're doing in Europe. 
I want to quickly just touch on China here, which is um, notably just in the past 24 hours has deleted several phrases in its latest monetary policy report, um, a move that is being widely interpreted as China signaling that it is shifting towards an easier policy. Uh, so the phrases had signaled a level of restraint in central bank policy, despite signs of growing slowdown in the economy. Um, so yeah, we have seen all of this year China, you know, really slowing in its in its uh, I guess GDP or economic growth, um, and yeah, seen a bunch of issues with the property sector as well and power shortages. So um, it's going to be very I guess seeing the trajectory of Chinese economic growth is going to be super important, in my opinion, heading into 2022, uh, because it does it does honestly just drive so much of the global economic activity, um, with so many countries such as even Australia here um, super reliant or you know correlated with Chinese growth and the state of the Chinese economy. Um, so yeah, always important to be keeping up to date with with the easing um, or the state of their monetary policy and their economy. Finally, I did just want to touch on that, um, just that continued, I guess, narrative of seeing inflation rising a lot higher than what analysts have been expecting and what central banks have been expecting. Um, and from over in Mexico, there was a a poll conducted by Reuters um, saying that Mexican annual inflation will likely accelerate to more than double the central bank's target rate in the first half of November. So why am I mentioning this? Yes, Mexico is just one country, but as I've covered in recent months, I think even a couple months going back, there were several Central American countries um, that have already started to lift rates primarily in response to inflation really increasing at a rate that is not is way too high um so another just data point here essentially with um this poll coming in you know with a really 6.8 point uh, 6.8 percent inflation um in mexico is what is expected which is um yeah well well more than double really what the uh, Mexican central bank would be comfortable with. Okay, moving on to crypto and the biggest news, most significant news from the past week. Um, one of them most certainly was El Salvador coming out with a plan regarding the creation of a of a Bitcoin city, uh, which would be funded through what is what they're calling a Bitcoin bond or a volcano bond, um, something something like that. So so let's get into this. Um, the Bitcoin bonds will be available in 2022, and El Salvador is also creating a new digital asset law. Um, so from my understanding, this Bitcoin city is going to be a separate, I guess, domicile, a separate, I guess, like self functioning city that will operate in accordance with its own with its own laws and will have its own mayor or mayor uh, as well and you're also seeing El Salvador or the Salvadoran president uh, Nayib Bukele um, he's come out here and estimated that the city's public infrastructure would would cost a total of about 300,000 bitcoin to put together so I guess what's the what's the takeaway of this? Like why why is this even significant? I suppose it's just a more of a more of I guess proof that El Salvador is um, really, or at least the Salvadoran president is really um, warming and really wanting to, you know, put El Salvador on the map as a Bitcoin friendly nation, which will even attract a lot of offshore currently offshore companies to come and set up either expand to el salvador or actually establish their headquarters and domicile in el salvador or this new bitcoin city um, we saw obviously the massive massive news earlier this year of el salvador being the very first country in the world to recognize bitcoin as legal tender 
Um, and now it's just, this is significant, this news, because it's now that extra step of, of El Salvador getting involved in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, and this, this announcement of this volcano bond or this, yeah, this Bitcoin bond was made in partnership with Blockstream, who are a massive uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology company who have been around since like 2012 or 2014. Um, and then they also partnered with iFinex, which is the parent company of Tether as well as Bitfinex. Um, so yeah, we'll be, the price didn't really react to this news um, because it, part of it was, I, I guess like Bukali had signaled a lot more was to come with respect to the country's plans uh, about what they will be doing in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, but it was nonetheless still, uh, even though it didn't move the markets, well, Bitcoin actually continued to dip during this announcement. Um, it was still significant because it's now just, hey, they've now disclosed more plans of what they are wanting to specifically do. Like when you say you want to get involved in the Bitcoin ecosystem, like that in and of itself is, is pretty vague. So it's nice here to see them um, actually making those plans a bit more concrete. Um, and I do believe those bonds will be going live in in 2023 or 2022, uh, he said. So these Bitcoin, these bonds are going to be partially backed by Bitcoin. If, from what my understanding of this is, I think 50-50 initially, it'll be 50% backed by Bitcoin. Um, and then as bonds work, you'll get a coupon rate or what's essentially an interest rate tied to if you are a holder of those bonds um so it'll be really interesting to see um how much is issued in this first i guess like tranche or this first offering of this bitcoin bond um because it could be it could be a very surprising um figure um so yeah that was i guess more to come on this um and it was just another i suppose innovation and and what I also like about it is it's another demonstration of the way that energy can be used to mine Bitcoin because, you know, they're calling it a volcano bond because, you know, these, this city will be centered around a physical volcano uh, with mining Bitcoin mining infrastructure set up, which will be tapping into the geothermal energy that's um, coming from the volcano. So, um, you know, Bitcoin does cop a lot of flack for its energy usage, but an increasing amount and uh, an increasing portion of that is is becoming um, used or sourced from renewable sources, as opposed to something like um, you know a non-renewable energy source such as such as coal. Okay, just speaking of, I suppose, countries' relationship with the crypto ecosystem, um, did see here in Australia, another senator um, kind of come out and, you know, speak on, on, on behalf or, or in, in um, support of, of the space. Um, in this case, it was the decentralized finance sector in particular. So Senator Jane Hume, who I believe is yeah, part of the the Liberal Party um, did come out yesterday in a, a summit held by the Australian Financial Review and basically did just like put forward, um, you know, the case that Australia, here in Australia, there are massive opportunities if, if the country does, you know, really become a, a hub for decent, the decentralized finance industry or DeFi, as some of you may have seen it um, shortened to. Um, this is more in response to, I think it was last week, uh, the central bank, so the Reserve Bank of Australia or the RBA, uh, someone from the RBA did, did come out and kind of, you know, you know, shoo shoo crypto as some sort of fad that will, you know, eventually pop and will be, you know, a long, a distant memory in the years to come. Um, so it was good to see some representation in the Australian government um to basically put forward the the opposite argument and that is kind of what the whole point of this um you know senate senate committee um hearings have been over the past three to five months or so and and i think it was in september 
um, or no, it was in October rather, the New South Wales Senator Andrew Bragg did publish his, or, you know, the, the, his Senate committee's crypto report, which had 12 recommendations um, submitted to the federal government. So first half of next year will be very um, huge in terms of, I suppose, developments in that regard. Um, and hoping to just essentially keep that dialogue going and, you know, really keeping those recommendations actually in discussion rather than just having them leave and, and finish as recommendations that never really get actioned. So, um, yeah, that's the state of play here in Australia. Um, still just sticking in Australia, we did see the largest bank, um, Commonwealth Bank. We know if you heard my podcast, I think two weeks ago, uh, they um, announced that they were launching a pilot program to support, you know, buying, selling and holding of several crypto assets, including Bitcoin and Ether. Um, and that was, that was, you know, very very welcome news and very surprising it personally it was surprising for me to see that so soon i think it, i knew it was going to happen or i had a high conviction that it was going to happen eventually but in november 2021 i i wouldn't have thought that would be how quick it has come um and now just in the past four days or four days ago we saw commonwealth bank once again come out with a crypto related announcement and this was, in fact, that they were confirming the news that they had made a small minority investment in Gemini, which, as we all, all those in the crypto space would know, are uh, one of the biggest um, and one of the oldest crypto asset exchanges uh, in the world. And they are run by the Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. Uh, for any of you who have watched The Social Network, or you know that they were the twins that were, you know, caught up in the whole founding of Facebook controversy. Um, and they've gone on to, you know, do extremely well for themselves, like, you know, founding and, and starting and still running uh, Gemini, which did launch in Australia a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Importantly, from the Commonwealth Bank's standpoint, this actually wasn't a, an investment through their venture arm, which I think is called X15 Ventures. Um, this wasn't even through that. It was actually just a direct investment from Commonwealth Bank of Australia, uh, which to me just signals even more of a willingness of ComBank to, you know, just get involved in the space and, you know, putting a minority, you know, investment as small as it may be. It's a strong signal that it emits that ComBank is wanting to you know, if not like, if not participate, like also just learn more about the industry and to see them now in alignment um, and financially incentivized to, you know, really work with Gemini and really keep on top of what Gemini is up to, um, which I'm sure that we're doing anyway, but it's just a really um, refreshing kind of stance to see them publicly um, coming out and, and making announcements such as this. Um, so, so very, very welcome news indeed. Sticking with banks and their kind of adoption or joining of the crypto ecosystem, we saw news today, um, or at least a time of recording, Tuesday 23rd of November, Australian time, uh, that Citigroup, so, uh, you know, a giant bank in the, in the US, um, they did promote a, someone to head their blockchain and digital assets department. And the more important news um, from that was the news that this person is actually going to be in charge of eventually um, hiring up to 100 roles um, to build out this, this digital asset division. So, yeah, that's just, um, you know, really phenomenal to see, again, just a traditional banks just getting more and more involved in the crypto space. Um, and we've seen the likes of JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, um, just to name a few in the US, um, have really just continued to hire uh, talent from the crypto asset sector um, to build out their own internal research teams um, and their own advisory teams as well. So um, great to see that trend continuing with the news from Citigroup today. 
Okay, on to some adoption news, and this was this was a big a big one this week. Uh, there were there were several um, you know high profile news of like adoption of either Bitcoin or just crypto assets in general. Who are we starting off with here? We've got the NFL yeah, NFL star Odell Beckham Jr., um, who is now committed to taking his entire salary with his new team, the Los Angeles Rams. Um, he's taking his insi- entire salary in Bitcoin, so denominated in Bitcoin, not getting any US dollars, but he's get, getting paid entirely in Bitcoin. Um, this announcement was made in collaboration with um, Square's Cash App, so Square being the US payment, uh, huge payments company in or predominantly in the US, but also now globally and now the actual, the parent company of Afterpay, a very, very um, popular company here in Australia, uh, buy now, pay later. So that was um, that was just very big news there from Odell Beckham Jr. We have seen him uh, as we've been covering. Um, he has had taken a liking to CryptoPunks, um, so very popular non-fungible token or NFT, um, setting that as his Twitter profile for the past couple of months, I believe. Um, and now seeing him actually come out and being paid in Bitcoin um, was just massive, massive news for um, just the awareness of Bitcoin. And I guess just, um, yeah, that was that was the big takeaway there. Sticking with Square um, and just more adoption news, they did release a white paper um, from its TBD division uh, describing a protocol that will be used for exchanging digital and other assets in a way that's more accessible to everyone. So pretty vague description there, but we've got a quote maybe to um, to explain it just in a bit more detail. I will quote here directly from the white paper. The This decentralized exchange they are calling for now is called TBDEX. So just to quote here, the TBDEX, protocol facilitates decentralized networks of exchange between assets by providing a framework for establishing social trust utilizing decentralized identity or DID and verifiable credentials or VCs to establish the provenance of identity in the real world so yeah just another huge huge announcement and to see Square continuing to get involved in the Bitcoin industry um, whether it's through mining or whether it's through education initiatives and support for buying and selling Bitcoin through their cash app. Um, I know I've said before um, when I do, I would expect Afterpay to, you know, launch some sort of Bitcoin integration next year now that Afterpay is owned by Square. And yeah, yet again, and yet another initiative with this TB Dex. Um, So, you know, keep your eyes on Square. Uh, They are definitely concocting some more um, initiatives, services, products that really will, I guess, take Bitcoin to the next level in terms of, I guess, educating the public on what Bitcoin can do and what it is, what it can be used for. Um, And that separately, we're also seeing, you know, Jack Dorsey here, also CEO of Twitter, uh, as well as Square, um, it's worth just pointing out to you that, you know, just a reminder that Twitter is also working on really um, connecting and integrating non-fungible tokens into their social media platform, Twitter. Um, so just, yeah, do not sleep on Square and Twitter or more the the common thread in that do not sleep on um on what jack dorsey is is up to over at square and twitter and i'm expecting you know even bigger announcements and actual launching of all of these plans heading into 2022 sticking with big news of the the merging of fintechs and crypto just went through square there um and now finder a extremely popular comparison website and money app here in Australia. Um, They launched a new crypto product just yesterday, I believe, um, which offers its users 4%, a 4% return to exchange AUD, Australian dollars for stable coins. 
So stable coins, as many of you would know, um, are just cryptocurrencies or crypto assets that uh, the value of which is actually pegged to a fiat currency, um, or at least they're the most popular ones. There are, you know, different types of stable coins, which I will refrain from getting into for the sake of this weekly recap. Um, so we've, we're have we seeing Finder here announcing um, some sort of stable coin. Let's see what one it is. Okay, Finder's customers will see in the app their holdings of an Australian dollar stable coin known as True AUD, a digital representation of the fiat currency created by Trust Token, which is backed by major venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Um, so yeah, Trust Token is a crypto company that I have yeah, seen around for quite a while now, and they have a bunch of these sorts of integrations and just continuing to create stable coins or different, different fiat currencies. Um, so the true AUD is the one being used here by Finder. Um, Finder will use the cash it raises from customers to invest in global crypto markets for what it expects will be lo a larger return than the 4% it is offering its users. So a big, I guess, vote of confidence there from Finder. Um, a lot of people do ask, okay, if Trust Token is just offering a stable coin, what is in it? For these venture capitalists like why do these what why would they invest in a stablecoin issuer um and here's kind of you're kind of seeing this kind of logic here in in finders approach also um that what the what the idea is is that the stablecoin issuers will earn revenue through many things such as partnerships so a major source of that revenue would actually just be interest revenue from holding all of that fiat money in a bank account um however um we are living in times of historically low interest rates so the business model for stablecoin issuers would have been an absolute killer in like the 90s or the early 2000s when interest rates were like you know high single figures early um or even low double digit figures um but it is still a it is still a a sector of the crypto economy that has just exploded in growth um, why has it exploded in growth? It's just because stable coins are just, they make it so easy for crypto market participants to just move their money around without, um, without really having to cop a lot of conversion fees and transaction fees that they would otherwise have to do if they kept going between financial intermediaries. Um, and another, just on that, another huge, um, stablecoin use cases then also for the use case of sending um sending money or cash um overseas so if i'm sending money back to someone in south korea um i can just send uh, my australian stablecoin and then they can convert it into their their stablecoin that's tied to the korean one um which could, they could do for an like a lot like significantly cheaper than what they would otherwise do if i sent them some aud via a bank account and then they would have to then transfer that to Korea. Um, what they're left with would be a lot less versus that stablecoin example. So yeah, seeing Finder come out with this crypto product, again, just pushing crypto more and more into the mainstream. And why am I even, why am I even covering all this if, given that the target, given that for members and the public, I'm really speaking a lot to investors in the crypto space and people who just want to learn more about crypto from the perspective of investing all of this is just it's just like really just helps the mainstreaming of crypto to be honest and all of these announcements bit by bit um no pun intended all just help i guess the overall awareness and appreciation of the value propositions of crypto assets and for those that all hear about these news it'll force or not force it'll it'll just, you know, prompt some of them to, you know, in, uh, invest their time into learning about the space further. Um, and then a portion of those would then even invest money. Um, so it invest their money into crypto assets, which in theory would drive up, drive up the price for the rest of us who are either already in the market. Um, so yeah, that's why I just want to just remind you of why all of these announcements matter. 
um, even if you are just a, an investor in at the moment who has a high conviction that crypto is going to go up anyway. Um, it's kind of just seeing it all happen in real time. Speaking of which, this is probably, in my opinion, the biggest news of the week in terms of just that awareness kind of that I was just talking about about a minute ago. Um, what happened here? Um, so Los Angeles, iconic Staples Center, which many of you basketball fans would be familiar with. Uh, so Los Angeles Arena, this is where the Los Angeles Lakers and Los Angeles Clippers in the basketball uh, they play, um, and I think for 20, 25 years, this arena has been called Staples Center. S as of December 25 or Christmas Day, uh, this will officially be known as, I think, Crypto.com Arena. As I'm not, yeah, Crypto.com Arena. So, yeah, talk about putting crypto in front of just the masses. Um, what bigger way to do it than by naming one of the most iconic arenas in in the world really to be honest like in terms of sports arenas um, and recognizability familiarity um, this is staples center is up there with um, the most recognizable names of sports stadiums so this um, was put together in partnership obviously with crypto.com um, which is a, a singapore domiciled uh, crypto exchange They've got the naming rights for 20 years, which um, sources are saying is actually the biggest sporting venue deal in history. Uh, so I just wanted to say that again. This crypto.com announcement or this this deal for the venue's rights, naming rights, has been said to be the biggest sporting venue deal in history at $700 million US. Um, so talk about coming in just with a, well, with more of a splash, just a, a cannonball, so to speak. Um, and yeah, I think you can just, you can just see it now. This will now be actually announced on Christmas day, which for any of you basketball fans, that is a probably the biggest day in the basketball calendar. Um, or at least in Australia here, it's always on boxing day. Um, so that will all tie in, like just get huge awareness around crypto. We saw earlier this year, um, I think just two months ago, to be honest, um, Miami's basketball arena got renamed to FTX arena. Um, and that was, that was massive. You saw FTX doing a bunch of um, promotions and like giving some of the crowd free crypto um, and things like that. Um, and then you're also seeing a lot of NBA teams also being sponsored by uh, crypto related companies. Uh, so I know Coinbase has been involved with a team um, this year. If I, okay, it's mistaking me which team it was. And then crypto.com um, will also be an official partner of the LA Lakers and the LA Kings hockey team. So um, yeah, very, very exciting to see all of that happen. And for any of you that have been following, I guess just sport, the convergence of sport and crypto this year you would have known that this is just the continuation of some massive massive um branding rights announcements that have come out of you know these well capitalized crypto companies such as crypto.com and f crypto.com and ftx have by far been the two biggest i suppose um you know um companies that have been announcing advertising related deals um, and naming rights deals um, so yeah this will in my opinion this will just keep going into 2022 but you know the stakes are getting in terms of outdoing one another um, between these crypto companies like you, we're really you know it's almost gets to the point where what's next like you've renamed the staples center which is as i said just just a huge huge widely recognizable arena so um, yeah, very exciting for the whole industry to see that um, announced. Okay, and now on to the opposite side of things. That is um, traditional companies getting actually reaching out and getting involved in the crypto side of things. Um, we saw Adidas actually um, announce a, a POAP token, which is a um, essentially a type of NFT that lets you... Um, it's, it's POAP is, is P-O-A-P, it's short for Proof of Attendance Protocol. Um, there's essentially just a little a little token um, 
you know, a token token, so to speak, that it's just essentially lets you prove that you have been to a certain event. Um, so I remember when the Australian blockchain Australia's um, crypto summit or uh, NFT summit rather was on um, two months ago or so, I, I I was one who signed up and got got a po up um, to just kind of you know recognize recognize the day. Um, and now I can look back on that in years to come and I can look at that token, which will still be there. Um, Adidas has essentially announced that they are doing some sort of PO app as well. So, um, like seeing just, just such huge brands come in and just experimenting, dabbling in the crypto space. We saw, you know, Nike, probably the biggest rival of Adidas. As I covered a couple of weeks ago, they, um, patented or applied for some patents related to metaverse um you know crypto metaverse or blockchain based metaverse types of patents um and now adidas has come out and and gotten involved in the nft space as well uh the terms of service make it clear that adidas maintains ownership of all the nfts um, which is worth noting, removing the concept of ownership crucial to the space's appeal. Um, so instead, the brand is teasing that the token may become useful later, likely for some sort of exclusive product release. Um, so yeah, it's a very teasing kind of announcement we've seen here from Adidas where they've just announced this PO app. You can, you can claim it um, if I'm not getting that wrong. Um, and you can basically maybe just hold that and they might in time reward something to all of those holders and all of those early adopters. Staying with Adidas, I did just want to mention also that today, um, 6.50, so yeah, just about 10 hours or so ago, uh, Adidas purchased a piece of land or virtual land um, in the sandbox. So the sandbox is one of the biggest blockchain-based metaverses out there up there with the central land and they have purchased if you see on my screen here uh, quite a hefty uh quite a big virtual plot of land um and that now it's got their logo on it and once sandbox does launch um, which i think their alpha is coming out in december um so once that metaverse does launch that that land will be added asses to build upon and to create whatever they want whether it's a, a headquarters or you know some sort of entertainment venue where they might have celebrities come in or you might have launches of adidas apparel happen in the metaverse which is in metaverses uh which is w in adidas's um section of land that you can see on my screen here um there's so many potential applications um for what what the company can do um but this was just, this lit a match under the price of SAND, S-A-N-D, uh, the token that is native to the sandbox. Um, and I think that did jump about 30% or so on the back of this news that we've seen today. Um, so just continuation of that really strong price growth in metaverse related projects um, over the past month or so since Facebook rebranded to Meta. Okay, sticking with NFTs here and another huge announcement today in terms of um, crypto asset managers getting exposure to NFTs and launching, you know, NFT um, focused funds. So Osprey Funds, which is a crypto investment firm that offers institutions exposure to several crypto assets. They announced late last week that it is breaking into the market for NFTs. Osprey will launch a new fund that might set the foundation for the firm investing hundreds of millions in the NFT market. So as I've been saying in, in recent weeks, um, we have seen a lot of crypto asset venture firms announcing funds that are dedicated to NFTs. And in my opinion, this is just huge validation for the NFT space and it'll really, in my, yeah, in my opinion, it'll you know, trigger a lot of price appreciation in the most premium NFTs um, as these firms essentially try to flex and try to show off um, how good they are at picking early stage NFTs or or even how good they are at, um, I suppose, contributing to a bigger NFT collection. So let's just say Osprey goes out and buys five crypto 
uh, or board ape yacht clubs or board apes or, or goes out and purchases three crypto punks um, you'll then see you know all of that awareness of crypto punks and all of that fervor and demand for crypto pumps punks likely um, increase as a result of that news uh, this all got started I think it was in August with three arrows capital they announced um, um, I'm forgetting the name of the the firm. It was some sort of ventures firm. Um, it'll come to me, but it was a ventures or oh, Starry Night Capital. That's it. Starry Night, I think, is a famous art piece. So Starry Night Capital was the very, very first NFT focused venture fund. But we've also seen, I think, last month, Galaxy Digital, massive crypto venture firm, they announced an NFT focused fund. And also saw Meta 4 Capital, so M-E-T-A, and then the number 4 Capital. They received investment from A16Z, and they, they are an NFT-focused investment fund. Um, and then you also saw Andrew Steinwald. He announced Spermion, um, S-F-E-R-M-I-O-N, which that is an NFT-focused uh, venture firm. And then I think Matty, DCL Blogger, he's about to announce an NFT uh, fund as well. So this is just hugely, um, hugely bullish really for the whole NFT sector. And this will really accelerate the takeaway for us as investors. This will accelerate, in my opinion, the infrastructure side of the NFT space, which will allow us to do more things with our NFTs heading into next year. Uh, NFT swaps is a huge one. We've seen um, a number of NFT swap protocols being announced in the past few weeks. Um, and then also just NFT display kind of apps as well. And just more, I guess, advanced solutions when it comes to joint bidding on NFTs and fractionalization of NFTs. So I'm seeing a lot more of this trend next year going into NFT fractionalization and group, you know, group investing in in an NFT. So party bid at the moment is probably the leader in this regard. Um, just as I say that, like hearing myself say group investing really does unnerve me a bit with respect to um, regulations. Just that whole idea of um, group investing is definitely something... Um, that the SEC or securities um, agencies really don't like um, the sound of, um, and rightly so. There are a bunch of um, you know group investing type of things that, that do go downhill um, without proper oversight and, and such. Um, so that that aside, I still think we are going to at least see that fractionalization really be pushed to the nth degree until potential regulatory measures are announced later next year um, but this is all in my opinion like a benefit of why we're seeing these massive funds they will announce they will buy the biggest nfts which are now being priced out for the average person so like a hundred thousand dollar crypto punks like not average person can afford that but what i do see coming into next year is is those fraction those nfts being fractionalized and then communities forming around that single that single art piece or that single high-end nft and then you know that community will then form and create a bunch of a bunch of um you know content and creative endeavors based around that single nft um that's at least where i see a kind of a huge opportunity next year um and in addition to that you'll also see just the continuation of um, the convergence of DeFi and NFTs. Um, so the convergence of NFTs and DeFi is another like big benefit of seeing all these NFT funds because they will also help bootstrap all of these protocols and, and apps that are working on ways to make it possible for you know yourself to put down your NFTs collateral and borrow some stable coins, for example. Um, that's going to be something that will be happening next year for sure. You can guarantee, I, yeah, I can guarantee that now. If I come back to me in a year or so, if that's not live yet, then um, then yeah, we we can talk about that. But um, <laughs> that's a bet I'm like highly highly confident in. It's just because 
there's just so much capital tied in in these high-end nfts that um you know it's just such a huge opportunity to make to make those nfts be used as collateral okay just more nft adoption news here penfolds very popular wine producer here in australia a luxury wine estate they announced that an nft um which was nft collection tied to um what was it tied to a it's rare magil seller three or magil seller three barrel of wine made from 2021 vintage um, available to purchase for US $130,000. The single barrel NFT will be converted into 300 bottle NFTs at the date of bottling the wine in October 2022, with each bottle being identified with both a barrel and bottle number. So I think this was announced in collaboration with Blockbar, which are a new NFT marketplace for luxury wine and spirit products. So again, another trend that i can see that i already am seeing and, and just a continuation of that i expect going into next year will be these physical items having an nft associated with it uh, so we're seeing that a lot with like music so like kings of leon for example earlier this year with their album announcement um, they let nft they tied an nft to it for those who wanted to purchase the album and get the nft which gave them a bunch of special rights um, I can see this happening with yeah the likes of wine producers as well, um, where the wine producer then gives the NFT holders a bunch of extra, I guess, loyalty benefits to really just like suppose reward their most, you know, their most dedicated followers. Okay, I also saw Sotheby's, so a massive um, traditional auction house their metaverse so they announced the metaverse i think a few weeks ago or at least a plan to build some sort of metaverse um so it's actually called sotheby's metaverse uh, they announced its collaboration with the public care public health care advocate and non-profit organization called sostento um, and it will be auctioning off its nft which is called gifted um, an 140 piece collection and Sotheby's is calling it the biggest NFT charity auction ever. So yeah, just more involvement by Sotheby's, which is over a hundred year old auction house, um, I believe. Uh, just seeing more and more of integration and, and involvement in the NFT space. We saw last week, uh, the US Constitution was auctioned off by Sotheby's and there was a crypto entity a DAO constitution DAO which formed which a lot of people pulled their capital together to in an effort to win the bid for the constitution or the copy of the constitution um, however they just fell short unfortunately but yeah Sotheby's let them bid in ETH so let them bid with their ETH currency as, a, as opposed to bidding in US dollars um, so that was a big development there as well, but yeah, unfortunately they didn't get over the line there for that constitution DAO, but, um, yeah, Sotheby's just dropping announcements like every other day and Christie's another huge US auction house. Both of them are really just driving this growth of NFTs and helping other, other audiences, really other, other types of people and businesses who aren't really involved in crypto that much. This is almost their gateway into learning about the power and applicability of blockchain technology. Okay. Moving on to the crypto markets, uh, starting with Bitcoin here on the daily time frame. And yeah, a lot, uh, quite a big drop off, really, like relative to the past few months. Um, over the past seven days, down from about mid sixties, mid sixty thousand US, down to mid fifty thousand US. So at the time of recording, fifty six thousand five hundred and eighty is what Bitcoin is trading at, which is in between the fifty and one hundred day moving averages. And on the RSI, the Relative Strength Index, really popular momentum indicator, is currently tracking at 40, which is more towards the oversold territory, but by no means is in oversold territory just yet, at least on the daily time frame. Um, so yeah, that, that's quite a big sell-off. What are we now? 
I think, um, just bear with me, 70,000 down to, down to 56 is about, um, yeah, it's about a 20% or so depreciation from the, the record high price we saw on the 10th of November. Um, many people would say it's a, a very healthy drawdown given, um, given the ridiculous rally that we saw that just never seemed to be stopping um, all the way back from July, to be honest, from 30,000 all the way up to 69,000. Um, so, you know, seeing this, I'm not too worried, I suppose is what I'm saying as a long-term holder. Um, by no means I'm looking to sell any of my Bitcoin at this stage because because I do expect it will go over record highs before the end of the year. I think we will see another run up that will go over 70,000 um, and over 80,000 uh, this year is what, what I foresee happening at least. Um, so by no means am I selling any Bitcoin or ETH for that matter. Um, and yeah, just slowly, slowly adding to my positions, um, I guess in a way that's in alignment with my own personal investment strategy and my own risk tolerability. Um, and then also buying some, some altcoins and, and adding to my positions in some of my favorite, favorite altcoins, I suppose is what I've been doing in this most recent dip because yeah, as I said, I am expecting Bitcoin to lead the way on another leg higher and then as always, that will you'll then see a rotation of those Bitcoin gains into Ethereum and and all of the other major crypto assets. And then once that blue chip kind of sector subsector has been really seen a run up, you'll see a rotation back into more riskier, even you know longer tail kind of crypto assets and even NFTs as well. So that's at least where I'm seeing the state of play at the moment and. You know, I'm not I'm not a chartist or a technical analyst, so I can't tell you, you know, when exactly we're looking for, you know, a minute by minute kind of bump up in the price of Bitcoin and ETH. But um, you know, I do think that this sell off is one that we were always going to have. It it just could not continue, like couldn't continue for like several more months after already going up like more than double in price in the case of Bitcoin. In the case of ETH, almost tripled, tripled in price from July to you know late or early November. So yeah, it's a, it's a healthy sell-off, and as we've been seeing on the on the member platform with um, Checkmate's excellent coverage of of all the latest you know on-chain goings-ons and, and happenings um, with respect to Bitcoin uh, in particular. Sometimes sometimes ETH as well. Um, yeah, he's he's definitely still not seeing not seeing long-term hands really long-term holders are not selling at least in a net from a net standpoint um, and a lot of the movement of coins is happening from the the younger holders or the short-term holders so that's another huge reason why i believe that we still have another leg higher because there's so much conviction by by the long-term market participants um so yeah eth at the moment is at forty one thousand five hundred and uh, sorry, rather 4,157 US dollars. Um, and it's a bit closer right now. It's just touching the 50 day moving average. So it's a bit, yeah, it's closer than Bitcoin, um, much closer than Bitcoin. And, but still on the daily time frame, it's, a, it's about exactly the same. It's at 45 on the RSI as a close post to Bitcoin, which is just a bit above 40. Um, so yeah, I do think Bitcoin, uh, sorry, I do think ETH will surpass 5,000, um, which will then imply that, yeah, it has surpassed all-time highs. I do think that will happen by the end of the year, personally. Um, I'm happy to kind of say that. Um, but yeah, it only put in as much as, um, I guess, you yourself are comfortable with. And that's something we really push on Collective Shift is just to really you know, figure out why you are even investing in the crypto asset space and how much you're willing to put in, how long are you going to hold it for, um, is all just super, super necessary because it can get super volatile at times, this this market, especially, yeah, relative to to all other type of asset markets in the world. Um, but with volatility comes a lot of opportunity. So, um, 
yeah, it really just depends on your personality and risk tolerability, as I said. So check out the Collective Shift, um, the Knowledge Center, our beginner's course, if you want more information on just figuring out what kind of investor you are. In terms of my outlook for the next um, next week or so, what I'm paying close attention to is the uptake in layer two, I guess, usage and the total amount of uh, value that's been deposited into layer two. So for those of you unfamiliar with what I mean by layer two, it's just a, think of it as just like another like in the case of Ethereum, for example, you have um, this, that's called the Ethereum blockchain. But if you could imagine um, a layer two, it's just another kind of network that is built on top of Ethereum. So it still speaks to Ethereum. But when you do transact on one of these layer two solutions, um, it's going through that separate that separate network if to really dumb it down as, as much as possible. And that, that separate network essentially just periodically talks to Ethereum just to validate and verify um, all the balances that are going on on its own network. Why is it such so important? Why am I paying so much attention to it? The more that can these layer two networks can be um, used, uh, the better it will be for it, the, the more, I guess, easing of pressure there will be on those that are using the the actual ethereum blockchain um why do we need that so desperately right now from the case of ethereum um, we need that we need all as much possible activity to go to these second layer solutions just to really make ethereum transaction fees or gas fees as low as possible because they still are at like insanely high prices um historically high prices which is being very unfortunate for newcomers that are looking to maybe you know put in five hundred dollars to an nft and um you know that having to spend a hundred or so in transaction fees just just to acquire that nft if they're not comfortable with these layer two solutions is is the only option at the moment which is very unfortunate so um to that end it was very pleasing to see in the past couple of days the amount of usd locked and at actually at the time of recording the amount of eth which is the one i actually value more in looking at is at all-time highs so we've got almost yeah we've got 1.4 million eth um locked into or deposited into layer two solutions uh the biggest gainer over the past seven days is by far boba network so b-o-b-a network which is built by the team behind um omg network or what was formerly known as omisa go um so they've launched some big incentives i believe over the past few days and that's why we're kind of seeing a huge um huge uptick in, in activity on there as is typical of all of these layer two solutions they kind of need to create incentives financial incentives for people to actually go over and actually try out those solutions because to be honest it can be intimidating for just a part-time someone who is part-time in the space and someone who maybe works a full-time job and only really has a couple of hours to devote to crypto every week for those sorts of people these networks these layer two solutions are highly intimidating so putting these financial incentives behind it to kind of you know give people rewards for using the network is what's going on at the moment that's going to continue definitely into next year as more of these go live um, and hopefully that will ease a lot of pressure on Ethereum's gas fees. Um, all the while, um, whilst that it doesn't improve, which is, I don't see it for like improving, like definitely not this year, um, at least materially. What I mean by that, I don't mean, I don't see gas fees improving like materially by until the, like in 2021, I think we'll start to see some improvements at the start of 2022 just because of these layer two solutions having more time being operative and more of them i suppose just building up a bit of a reputation which makes it more more reliable and more trustworthy from maybe someone who's just on the fence about joining a layer two solution so whilst that's still going on and whilst i expect ethereum to still be having issues with gas um i would expect to see you know as I've been covering the past few months, I would expect to see these bigger, 
these you know other non-ethereum blockchains um continue to just benefit from total value locked and and to see more usage so um as we can see here on DeFi llama um the seven day changes avalanche has still continued to be a huge um, beneficiary of ethereum struggling ethereum struggles from a gas standpoint um and they themselves are just yeah putting up some huge incentives to try and lure across activity um and yeah chronos has been another one in the past in the past week or so that's had some some strong um rise in activity and total value locked um but yeah that's at least where my head's at as i've been saying in the past few weeks and months i would expect these other layer one tokens to outperform eth because unfortunately i don't think ethereum's gas fees are going to get better um you know definitely not before this year is over um they still need time for these l2 solutions to, yeah, to build up that reputation so i can i continue to expect to see these l1 tokens outperform eth um at least in the short term um but yeah medium to long term still a lot more conviction um personally in holding eth i did just want to mention before i wrap things up that we did see binance speaking of l2 solutions announced the full integration with arbitrum one which is one of you know these huge layer two solutions that are building on top of ethereum and you know one that is touted as seeing potentially the biggest amount of users um, up there with optimism um, those two are highly touted as seeing the most amount of activity so to see binance which is yeah a crypto exchange yes but also a operator and i guess the inventor creator of bsc or binance smart chain which is you know seen as in many ways as a competitor to ethereum to see them fully integrate arbitrum one was um yeah very surprising to see personally um and will be yeah super helpful for what i was talking about earlier and just to make it more comfortable for users to use these l2 solutions um what better way to abstract away the experience than for an exchange to actually just maybe loop it in in the back end and not even tell the user that they're using the l2 um that could be a great way um to kind of just help these l2 solutions get more adoption so binance hopefully will be able to do that uh, next year as they kind of work on these integrations over the coming weeks really um, but yeah, I'll wrap things up there. Um, plenty going on in Collective Shift as always. November's been a massive, massive month um, for the whole team here. Um, last week in particular, launching the our next portfolio report. So this one, as many of you would have seen, was our long-term growth portfolio. So, you know, the research team here at Collective Shift actually, you know, putting together a Collective Shift portfolio that we as a company have put money into and have shared um and have shared the i guess the weightings the the allocations that were um that we've yeah we've allocated to each crypto asset that we hold so i think it's 12 that we have in there at the moment um and looking forward to kind of sharing those updates with members every month on on how that portfolio is performing and and also updating members i think on on it is every every day Oh, so ev like every time we make a change to the portfolio there will be same day um, notifications as well um, just to make it as transparent as possible but um, yeah it's never never a dull week here at Collective Shift where um, yeah been team's been working very hard and um, that was a great to see like, um, a really strong uh, reception and a very very happy reception by um, all the members to, to this um, inaugural issue of the um long-term growth portfolio report so um onwards and upwards and um yeah another strong strong end to the year is what we are looking forward to here um myself and the team but until then i will catch you again all next week and thank you for tuning in